This year at the annual conference session, uh, the people who will be attending, uh, representing uh, Centennial as members are uh, Reverend Tom Kimball and, uh, and myself as clergy, and our lay members are Fran Eldridge. You know, why don't you stand? Fran Eldridge and Sammy Sonny Vidividi. For the first time, yay, Sam, thank you. And Virisila Batiratu will be our alternate. In case anybody needs a break, <laughs> they can tag team and sit in. Thank you. And uh, so this is our team. And as we go to, um, to the conference, we are preparing to be engaged in what Mr. Wesley called holy conferencing. Holy conferencing meaning that we are going to sit down and talk with one another at a deeper level than we usually do much deeper than the fellowship time. Hey, how are you, how are you, how are things going at your church? <laughs> that kind of thing. We're going to talk, and the topic of our conversation is going to be a way forward, a way forward. There has been a huge amount of conversation across the globe within United Methodism and some outside as other denominations are watching us about this topic, but I realize that very little trickles down to the people in the pews. And so today, um, I want you to know that there may come a time when you have to make decisions, Centennial, about your way forward, and I want you to be prepared. Now, before we talk about this way forward, we need to look back at where we have been. As you know, we are celebrating our 50th anniversary, uh, celebrating the um, abolishment of the, uh, um, I just blanked, the, the central, yeah, the central jurisdiction and the uniting of the um, United Brethren with the Methodist Church. However, while we celebrate that, we also are very conscious that we, at the very same time, have been a denomination at war with itself for these 50 years. It was really kind of came out, to use a pun, at the uh, 1972 General Conference when we began to argue fiercely over how we as a denomination would respond to the new understandings of human sexuality in our modern and postmodern world that, were, um, that we were experiencing both within the church, among one another, and in the world. And we pretty quickly divided into two very um, uh, strong camps. And uh, one being... Um, the Reconciling Ministries, which um, I want you to know, I have been an um, activist in since 1981. And the other is the Good News Caucus. These are two sort of caucuses, political caucuses, um, which, yes, have been vying for um, effectiveness within the uh, direction of the United Methodist Church for um, all of these years. And it may have seemed from time to time, especially if any of you have seen or heard any of the rancor on the floor of the General Conference, that that's the battlefield. But it actually isn't. The battlefield is the Book of Discipline, which um, those of you who are attorneys know it's about law, and law is about words. Right, Archie? Right, Sammy? Law is all about what do the words say and what can they mean? And so in United Methodism, we have been using the scriptures and we have also been making law. And that's what the big argument is about. What will become the law of the United Methodist Church regarding people who do not identify themselves as heterosexual? That's what we've been arguing over and that's where it ends up in the Book of Discipline. Um, we've been doing this and we've been um, really harming each other and harming our witness all this time. And at the 2016 General Conference, uh, 
we recognized just how very close to schism we have been and we are at this moment, just a hair's breadth. And yet the cost of schism is huge, is unimaginable. And so the General Conference turned to the Council of Bishops in a formal proposal and asked that they lead us on a way forward into God's future that would lead us past the threat of schism and to a healthier place with one another. And that's where that language comes from, a way forward. Lead us, Council of Bishops, our spiritual leaders, lead us on a way forward. Well, the bishops, the council, met. They immediately went into executive session, and they met, and they talked, and they probably argued, but they came out with an idea of creating a committee. Does that surprise you? <laughs> but they called it a commission, and a commission is slightly different than a committee, but they called it the Commission on a Way Forward. And they... Um, called for that commission to be established immediately following that same general conference. And the work of that commission, the work that they gave it to do, is this. It's very clear. The commission will design a way for being church that maximizes, listen to this carefully, that maximizes the presence of a United Methodist witness in as many places in the world as possible. And, oh, wow, and that balances an approach to different theological understandings of human sexuality with a desire for as much unity as possible. Notice it does not say we're going to make a definitive declaration on homosexuality. It's about the witness of the United Methodist movement and the United Methodist Church as an institution. And so the Commission on a Way Forward studied three possible pathways or models of being church, ways of being church that might approach what the Council of Bishops was requesting of them. The first way has been called the traditionalist model, and essentially, uh, well, let me, I'll go into each one. The traditionalist model, the multi-branch, these are the words, language people are using now, multi-branch, one church, and just one church model. So three different ideas that they have been working on, um, and this has been, um, I'm trying to remember, 30, 32 people who represent widely different uh, views on these issues, and they come from all over the world of United Methodism. So here are the ways that they have explored. The traditionalist, which is essentially don't make any changes and leave us right where we were in 1972 and since. Um, with a lot of um, exclusionary language in the Book of Discipline toward people who are not heterosexual. Um, maintain the status quo is basically that, that option. The second is multi-branch one church, which is let's go ahead and separate all of those people who want to welcome people who are not heterosexuals in one part of the church, and then we'll, we'll just sort of separate everybody out. And a lot of the conversation has been, uh, toward that proposal has been, well, here we go with the central jurisdiction again. We're back to being a segregated church where some people who um, want to worship and be in community with certain people are over here and everyone else will be over here. The third way is, that's been called the one church is where each annual conference each local church, meaning you, Centennial, and every pastor, like myself, will have to decide for ourselves whether we will, how, how inclusive we will be in our mission and ministry with people who are not heterosexuals. Does that kind of give you an idea of those three? They looked at those three, and they decided to forward one to the Council of Bishops, which is this one, the one church model where everyone chooses for themselves, basically. But, and there's a big but, since there was not agreement on the commission about this, the other two options 
were also forwarded to the bishops, but not as a recommendation. Does that make sense? Well, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. The Council of Bishops received that report. Um, they finished their work in March. They gave the bishops the report. The bishops um, then received it and made their decision in May. And now they're arguing about what they decided. They came out of that meeting saying different things, depending what their leaning was. So there are, um, the majority of the bishops say they are recommending the one church model to the special general conference in 2019, in February, that will be held. And the other two are being added as information so that they understand the fullness of what the commission has um, uh, looked at. So that's kind of uh, where we stand. However, the bishops also asked for what is called a declaratory decision or a ruling of law because they have been quite concerned that with a special general conference, um, once you open that, who knows what could happen? And the bishops were very concerned that no one take, um, try to hijack that uh, legislative body outside of what their intent was. And so the bishops asked the ju uh, Judicial Council, which is our Supreme Court in United Methodism, what will be lawfully, legally before this body and what would be out of bounds? Well, <laughs> the Judicial Council responded this way. Um, oh, I'm sorry, this way. That any proposal in harmony with the stated purpose of the special session. Now, the council wanted them to say the, special, the stated purpose, period. But they broadened that to in harmony. Well, how are you going to define that? The, the general conference body itself gets to define what's in harmony and what would be out of bounds. And so we're back to pretty much anything may happen. Okay. So here is the stated purpose of this general, special general conference, the, the largest lawmaking body, or the only lawmaking body in our denomination in February of 2019, so it's coming very soon. Receiving and acting upon a report from the Council of Bishops based on the recommendations of the Commission on a Way Forward. And again, what the bishops have said is they are recommending to the general conference that one church model where everyone decides what they, will, um, what they will choose in terms of inclusiveness or exclusion. These are the possible outcomes that are in my mind and heart and weigh heavily on me. Um, the first one is the one church may prevail and then yes, Centennial, you will need to make a formal decision. No skirting around it. You will need to make a formal decision about how inclusive or exclusive toward those who are not heterosexual will Centennial be. Uh, the multi-branch, same thing. You'll have to make a decision which, if that prevails, which part of this divided church will you be? Um, the traditionalist would be no change. And you may still want to make decisions as individuals or as a congregation. And the fourth possibility is we may come out with even more restrictive language or exclusionary language around those who are not heterosexuals. That's possible, since anything can really happen in that um, general conference. And so it's time for us to go back to our roots in the scripture, again, as a very Wesleyan thing to do, and ask ourselves, who are we at our deepest level? What is essential to the identity of those who follow Jesus? Um, and I have no idea what Mr. Wesley would say if he had the benefit of all that we know today. Because certainly in, script, in biblical times, they didn't know much about human sexuality, and most of what they knew was wrong, was in error. But we need to go back to this text, I believe, from the very beginnings of Jesus' church in the book of Acts. And I hope most of you are familiar with this passage because there isn't time to go through the whole thing. But the whole thing is so valuable, and I encourage you to go back and read the whole context. Because most people who come to this passage um, really kind of fixate and focus on these Levitical laws that have dropped down in Peter's world. Remember, Peter is a Jew, 
And he has been, as the text says, a faithful follower of the Levitical law that precludes Jews from eating any of the meat that God's Levitical laws have, Moses' laws have called unclean. Thousand years before him, they've been very clear. It's unclean, it's unclean, it's unclean. And then Peter has a vision that rocks his world. And this sheet comes down and Jesus tells him, eat it, Peter, kill and eat. Kill and eat. And Peter says, no way. I have never violated that law, that Levitical law. And Jesus tells him, not once, not twice, but three times, Peter, kill, get up, kill and eat. And Peter three times says, no. And then the sheet goes back up to heaven, right? The context of this is not about Levitical law and its morality of following those laws or not. It's about the mission of Jesus' church. It's about the Great Commission. It's about reaching every child of God possible with the good news that God so loved the world that he gave his son for everybody, everyone. That's the point of the vision the point of this text. And Jesus says to Peter, don't call unclean that which I have made clean. And what is at stake in his decision, will he go downstairs and meet with Gentiles? Who are the Gentiles? The Gentiles are you and me. The unclean people who have been excluded by Judaic law from the kind of relationship with Yahweh, with the, the God of the Jews, have been excluded. That's what's at stake here. Will Peter go down and receive the way we're asking ourselves, who are we going to receive? Will he receive Gentiles into his life, into his relationships? These unclean people, will he violate the Levitical law and receive them or not? That's the point of this text. Don't miss it. It's not about 360 Levitical laws, some of which we follow, most of which we would not even think of following. Bishop Elaine Stanofsky recently responded to um, a member of the Good News Caucus who attacked her um, publicly in an article he wrote without contacting her or having conversation um, with her for appointing an openly gay clergy member to her cabinet. And in part, I want to share with you part of her, her public letter in response. She said this, we need a church that aspires to this vision. One church, a variety of expressions, one body, many parts. And then in her letter, she begins to talk about the ways that she has called her annual conference to holy conferencing between now and June, their, um, that was a little earlier in last month, um, to their annual conference, and how holy conferencing will continue at their annual conference session. They have over 50 people trained to lead holy conferencing throughout the annual conference. And this is what she says about that holy conferencing. God is at work when two or three are gathered. I'm expecting miracles. Centennial, I'm expecting miracles too. With that same expectation, I will be calling you to holy conferencing this fall as we prepare for that February 2019 special session of the General Conference. I want you to be ready I want you to be knowledgeable, and I want you to be spiritually ready in your heart for decisions that Jesus may give us. They may be surprising, they may not be, but there will be decisions at the end of those decisions. And so let us hold our denomination and one another and this great division in our hearts and pray for God's healing and God's, God's will to be done among us as in heaven. 
And now I invite you to be generous in the face of this uncertainty, because that's also who we are called to be as Christians. We don't hold back and see if we get our way, if the burger comes out as we ordered it. We give ourselves sacrificially every day to this God who gives every day to us.